All right, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whichever suits you guys. Uh, welcome back. Um, today, uh, I'd like to give you a brief video lecture uh, about one of the more important topics, I suppose, in science, but it's one that you've you know, probably learned a little bit about before, uh, you know, in another science class, maybe uh, middle school, or even going back to grade school. Uh, but I want to talk about the scientific method a little bit today. There's a couple of exercises uh, that you're going to do on Buzz. Uh, there's a lab, kind of a virtual lab that we're going to be doing as well uh, over the next couple of days. But before you do any of those things, in fact, just kind of let this kind of be like the norm going forward is before we do any of the buzz work, before you jump into it and before you, you know, try to attempt it, um, I would highly suggest always watching my videos about certain topics so that you can get some background knowledge before attempting those things. And that's, that's kind of an important thing, especially if you're an online learner, uh, for sure. So we're going to get started today. We're talking about the scientific method. Again, this is something that you've probably heard of before, but I'm going to kind of approach it a little bit differently. You know, instead of just going through and, and you know, saying, oh, these are the steps of the scientific method and you got to memorize these things. Instead, we're going to use uh, an actual case study and kind of understand how the scientific method is actually used uh, in the real world. Uh, and the example that I'm going to use today, uh, there's a there's a big huge term here, and we're, we'll talk about what it means in a second. Um, but but the, the scientific method all starts with it, it all starts the same way, and it starts with something called an observation. So if you kind of look at this here, it says in the 1990s, scientists suspected that chemicals found in insecticides Oh, by the way, there's a root word there. Hopefully we remember what that means. Might be leading to brain disorders in children. You know, things like epilepsy, maybe you've heard of that before. Autism, I'm sure you've heard of. ADHD. You know, these are all you know, brain disorders that in the 1990s, we saw a huge spike in these things, especially in kids. And a lot of scientists were kind of looking for reasons why we were seeing so many more kids you know, kind of diagnosed with these uh, disorders at, a, at an early age. And one of the things that scientists suspected was they thought it was linked to insecticides. You know, these are chemicals that are used to kill, right, side, that's a root word, means to kill, uh, insects. So they thought there was a, kind of some some link there between the two, you know, maybe exposure to insecticides, maybe by a pregnant mother, um, maybe that was causing a brain disorder in you know, her unborn child. And then when the child was born, they would have you know, autism or ADHD or, or, or epilepsy or whatever. So again, but this is just an observation. It wasn't, you know, they didn't know that this was true. They didn't know if it was true, but it was just something that was observed. Now, there is one specific type of insecticide. It's called chlorpyrifos. It's a big science word, but all it basically is, is a kind of a general type of insecticide that's used around the world. You know, it's not just used in the US, it's used in other countries. Uh, and it's used a lot of times just to spray you know, wooded areas and you know, try to kill insect larvae and things like that. But it's, it's a commonly used uh, insecticide. So if we're going to kind of, I guess, suggest that there's a link between insecticides and brain disorders, maybe we should look at like one of the biggest insecticides that was being used at the time, uh, which was chlorpyrifos. All right. So that was just kind of an observation. That's kind of how the scientific method sort of starts. Now, the second part of the scientific method, you, you've probably heard of this before, is called make a hypothesis. There's chlorpyrifos, by the way. You know, a hypothesis is you know, the, kind of the classic textbook definition. It's an educated guess. You know, I use the term here, educated assumption, but it, it's got to be something that's testable. Okay. So take a look at this here. It says chlorpyrifos lowers 
brain functions in rats. Now, notice before we were talking about children. You know, there's laws that prohibit us from testing chemicals on kids. So, you know, we're going to use rats instead as kind of our lab uh, you know, experiment. Um, but it says chlorpyrifos lowers brain functions in rats. Now, is that true? Is it not true? We, we don't know. You know, it's, it's just an educated assumption, but we have to have a way to test it. And we'll do that in the next step. Okay, so that's what a hypothesis is. Uh, is. Now, there's also something called a null hypothesis. And the reason why I introduced this to you is because it's a term that, you know, down the road, maybe in other science classes, you might come across this. But the term null hypothesis is, is basically kind of the opposite of the hypothesis. You know, so up here we said chlorpyrifos lowers brain functions in rats. You know, the null hypothesis would be that it does not lower brain functions in rats. I mean, if you're, for example, the CEO of the company that, that makes chlorpyrifos, you know, the, the null hypothesis sounds a lot more better to you, you know, than let's say this hypothesis up here. So, but the, the, the thing is, they're, they're both kind of testing the same thing. You know, one is just kind of the opposite of the other one. They're, you know, we, we can test both the, 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 the regular hypothesis and the null hypothesis using the same experiment. So that's kind of an important thing. Okay, so now step three. Step three is to actually go out and do the experiment. And I'm going to talk to you on the next slide about a whole bunch of things that we have to kind of consider anytime we're doing an experiment or we call it a controlled experiment. Now, before we go on to the next slide, let's take a look at this picture here. It's very simple, right? You got your scientists here in the middle. And we, we basically have two different setups, right? On the left here, we have what we call the experimental group. So here we have some rats in this container, this box or whatever. And over here, this is called the control group. Okay, this, again, we have a, a different group of rats, but whatever. Now you'll notice that really the only difference between the groups, because they're kind of kept in the same container and they've got, you know, some water in there and they've got like some bedding to walk around on, whatever. But the only difference between the two is what we're feeding them. You know, in the experimental group, we're going to feed these rats chlorpyrifos. You know, put it in their food or whatever we're going to do. The control group, we're not going to expose those rats to chlorpyrifos. So this is kind of an important thing because, you know, we, we want to test to see, okay, what's going to happen to these rats in our experimental group? Maybe nothing will happen, right? Uh, but we have to compare that to a group of rats where we're not, you know, giving them chlorpyrifos. So that should probably make sense. We've always got to have that control group in order to compare, okay? So the components of a controlled experiment, those first two things that I just talked about, we, we've got to make sure that we have two separate groups. You know, one's the experimental group. Again, that will be the group of rats that's being fed the chlorpyrifos. And then we have the control group, which is the group of rats that we're kind of leaving alone. We're not, you know, exposing them to that chemical. Okay. Um, the other thing too, I, and I already mentioned this, and I think it's really important. I'm going to go back to this, this picture real quick. It's really, really important that everything else between these two groups is kept exactly the same. You know, I mean, we don't want to alter anything else when it comes to these two groups of rats. We want to keep everything the same. You know, we want to make sure that we have the same number of rats in this group compared to this one. We want to make sure the size of the box is exactly the same. We, we, we don't want to introduce another variable that might affect the rats one way or the other. So really the only difference between the two, again, is going to be that one variable um, that we're testing. That leads us to these two terms, the dependent variable and the independent variable. Okay, a lot of kids have trouble, you know, kind of distinguishing between the two. 
So let's first talk about the dependent variable. The dependent variable is, is very simple. It's just ask yourself a question. What are we testing? Like, wh what are we doing? You know, we're testing the brain function in RAS. That's what we're measuring, right? So whatever it is that we're measuring is what your dependent variable is. Okay, so we're going to measure the function of the brains in these rats. Now, the independent variable is what we believe is going to affect the dependent variable. So we already stated in our hypothesis that we thought that chlorpyrifus was going to affect the, the brain functions in rats. Right, so the brain function is your dependent variable. And that is dependent on the chlorpyrifus. So if the rats don't have the chlorpyrifus, we can probably, at least we're guessing, nothing's going to happen to them. But if they do get exposed to it, then, you know, there's going to be some brain problems or something, right? So make sure we kind of understand the differences between those two. So I always tell kids to kind of think, you know, what are we measuring and what will affect those measurements? If you know what you're measuring, that's your dependent variable, okay? What's going to affect those is your independent, okay? Controlled variables, these are things that are exactly the same between the two groups. So we mentioned this earlier, right? The two different groups of rats, we want everything to be the same except for the independent variable, okay? So the amount of water we give them, the size of the cage, all that stuff we want to be exactly the same. Another thing that we kind of want to, to, I guess, do the best we can with, but um, we always want to try to use a large sample size. You know, we want to kind of use, like, for example, if we're testing rats, right? I mean, would it be good to only use one rat, you know, to do this experiment? You know, maybe, you know, maybe you can manage nine or 10 rats. Maybe that would be better. You know, the more the better. You know, if you only have a small sample size, you know, that could lead to misleading results. But I always tell people, hey, if, if we're trying to, to, to test something, we want to try to use the biggest sample size that we can, but you got to be able to manage it. You know, going back to this scientist here, you know, you know, let's say she's working in a lab all by herself. You know, she could she can manage, you know, maybe 20 rats. She probably couldn't manage 400, okay? So, I mean, you know, you want it to be as big as you can, uh, but again, the larger the sample size, most likely the better off it's going to be. And finally, the, the experiment should be able to be repeated. So whatever experiment you're going to do, you know, should easily be able to be done again, and the results should really be the same every single time you do it. That's a good characteristic of a controlled experiment. So, again, all of these things... Um, are all accurate and precise measurements, of course. You want to make sure you measure correctly and use your instruments correctly, all that type of thing. Now, these are all things that, again, are, are just characteristics of a good controlled experiment. All right. Now, collecting data. You know, if you're going to do an experiment, you're going to collect some data. And I just want to make sure that you're familiar with this. There, there's two terms here uh, because there's two different types of data. You know, one of them is called quantitative data, and the other one is called qualitative data. Quantitative data is really measured data. And here's some examples here. Okay, it says each rat was given one milligram of chlorpyrifos a day. Okay, whatever. That's a measured thing, right? I mean, it's a measured piece of data. There were nine rats in the group. Okay. The average length of the rat was 42 centimeters. If you can measure it or count it, it's a quantitative piece of data. Quantity, think of that term, right? You know, quantity is amount. So if you have an amount of something or a measured amount of something, it's a piece of quantitative data. Qualitative data is more descriptive data. It's not really measured. You know, the rats were white. The rats had fuzzy tails. Okay, I mean, yeah, these are things that um, aren't really measured, you know, but they're still, you know, you know, types of data, I guess, that you could collect, I suppose. Yeah. All right, interpreting the results. 
So let's say that we run this experiment or this woman, this lab worker runs the experiment and she writes down the following. It says rats in the experimental group, those are the ones that we fed the chlorpyrifos to, showed lower levels of a brain enzyme called choline acetyltransferase. That's a big, huge science word, right? Scary word. All it is, it's an enzyme that's found in normal brain functions. So think about this for a bit. These rats in the experimental group, we, we fed them chlorpyrifos. Those rats now have a lower level of this enzyme. So what that tells us is that their brains are not functioning the same as the rats that weren't fed the chlorpyrifos. Okay. I mean, that's just what she found. Okay. So let's think about this. I mean, so what does that really mean? Okay. Well, let's think about this. Will all rats, now we only tested what, nine or 10 rats. Will all rats have a lower brain function if they're exposed to chlorpyrifos? We don't know that. I mean, this experiment, you know, we tested nine or 10 rats. Those nine or 10 rats had a lower brain function if they, because they were exposed to this. Does that mean that every rat will? We can't really say that, okay? We can only comment on what was actually found. Will all rats have brain disorders like autism or epilepsy, things like that? I mean, this, this experiment, you know, this result here didn't say anything about the rats having epilepsy or autism. It didn't say that. It just said that they have this enzyme that's lower than normal. Okay, so we can't really say that these rats all have epilepsy, right? Because they don't. Now, here's kind of the bigger, bigger question, I think. Will humans, like human children, have the same problems if they're exposed to chlorpyrifos? I mean, will, will human, I mean, because this enzyme, choline acetyltransferase, not only is it found in rat brains, it's also found in human brains. So will human children have the same problems? We didn't run this test on human children, right? I mean, we did this on rats. So one thing I think that's really important about the scientific method is that a good scientist doesn't just make an assumption. You know, if this woman did this experiment and this is what she concluded, you know, she can't go saying, oh, well, you know, human children now, if they're exposed to chlorpyrifos, they're all going to have epilepsy. She can't say that because she can't prove that. You know, she can just kind of comment on what her findings showed. Right, I think that's a really important thing to sort of understand. Now, step five of the scientific method, and here's a word maybe you've never heard of before. It's called disseminating. Disseminating your findings basically means to let the world know. I mean, this woman that ran this experiment, you know, there's probably people out there that, that would like to know what her results were. So she has to disseminate, she has to make sure that she communicates to other people what she found. That's what disseminating means. You know, here's a little, uh, a little article, it's a little abstract uh, from a scientific journal uh, from an experiment that was done. Just, just look at the title here. It says the effect of chlorpyrifos on the immune function in rats. Now, this is not the same experiment that we just talked about, but this one here is, is, is about how chlorpyrifos affects the immune system. You know, the immune system is the system in your body that helps fight off diseases. So they ran this experiment. This is just you know, a part of it here. I'm sure a bunch of the terms you don't really understand. But, but this, sci this scientist uh, or this series of scientists here, they, they, they did this experiment and they came up with their conclusions and they disseminated it. They published it in a, in a journal. And that's a really important thing as well. All right. So just as a quick review, okay, you know, if I asked you, you know, hey, what are the steps of the scientific method? 
right? Observation, make a hypothesis, you know, set up an experiment, you know, conduct an experiment, you know, collect your data, and then of course, interpret your results, make your conclusion, and then disseminate your findings, okay? So make sure we kind of know those steps. All right, that's it for me for today. Um, look in your agenda. There should be a couple of assignments and there should be some directions for those. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me uh, when you see fit. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody.